Welcome back to America's Talking. I'm Austin Berg. Today, I'm so pleased to be joined by my friend, Niels Jorgensen. Niels worked as a New York City firefighter for more than 21 years, but his firefighting career was cut short by an advanced form of leukemia diagnosed in 2011, which was attributed to exposure to toxins at the 9-11 World Trade Center Rescue and Recovery Operations. Niels is also the host of the 20 for 20 podcast, which tells 20 stories of 20 forgotten heroes from 9-11 for the 20th anniversary of that fateful day. Thanks for joining me, Niels. Well, thanks for having me, Austin. I appreciate it. One thing that always strikes me about your story and the stories that you've told on your podcast, which I highly recommend everyone listen to, is this sense of duty and obligation. And really, almost everyone you talk to who you know ran toward the wreckage that day, there was never really a question in their mind of whether or not to do it. It was almost a it was an instinct that was unquestioned uh, to do these really brave and extraordinary things. Where does that come from? Do you think? Well, I, I think Austin, it has to come from deep down within your your soul, your spirit. Um, I think to take a job as a first responder or a nurse or someone in the military world, it has to be within you. So it's, it's not like going to a job where you're punching a clock for 40 hours and you know looking at five o'clock coming around and take off for the weekend. It's more of a calling, I guess. Uh, so when, when tragic events happen, you don't even think twice about doing what it is you're obligated to do which is to try to protect others and save them from harm. Um, I have an expression I like to use. Unfortunately, it's it's too common now is that there's a bunch of people out there that are willing to give up all of their tomorrows so you can have yours. Um, Just yesterday, New York City Fire Department, we lost a young 31-year-old firefighter, Timothy Klein, uh, who was in the midst of searching a building for possible trapped victims. And um, unfortunately, he was caught in a collapse and subsequently died from his burns. Um, And two days before that, there was a young police officer in South Carolina who was shot to death on a disturbance call, a domestic dispute. So you have these responders, uh, you know, not just on 9-11, but but in perpetuity that are willing to give up every one of their tomorrows for for your today. Um, And... That's, that's within their soul, that's within their spirit, and that's what they do. And it's not for a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And as we well know, in the last bunch of years, first responders have sort of had a little bit of a target on their back, so to speak. Um, I'm not going to say that everyone in the military responder world is perfect because human beings are valuable and uh, we all have our faults. But I have to say that I think a vast, vast majority of the folks in those jobs are there to help others. So obviously the events of 9-11 affected everyone differently. And there's such a ripple effect from those who were in the towers to those who were, you know, uh, halfway around the world. It affected everyone differently. Um, And it probably even affected every first responder differently in a way. Um, What is something that changed about your life or perspective after you went into the wreckage and, and spent so many days um, really at ground zero? Well, what initially what took place was uh, my fellow responders and I, and then days into it, recovery workers, it was almost like being in a war zone. Um, you know, the morning of 9-11, within minutes, there were fighter jets flying over, flying sorties just over the site continuously for security. Um, I think what happened is pretty much immediately we realized we were all suffering a mortality crisis. Uh, So many of our friends in the height of their lives, you know, friends that were in their twenties, their thirties, their forties, they were just taken, they were gone. And uh, after we were able to get back to our family several days later, uh, I think that set in that it very well could have been any of us. You know, my, one of my childhood best friends, John Shart, who was a wonderful human being, uh, John was on shift that morning and I wasn't, I was working my side job and John was killed. 
And unbeknownst to the both of us, our wives were pregnant with our third child each. And in May of 2002, my little girl, Catherine, was born three days before my my John's son, John Jr. And John never got to hold John Jr. So that that haunted me till still to this day because every time I'm at an event with one of my children, uh, uh, my son Paul is going to graduate from college next week, and John's second son uh, will be graduating soon, and John won't be there once again. So it's it just I think we were all struck into an immediate mortality crisis. We realized how blessed we were to have life. Mm-hmm. how much of a gift everyday life is. And I think we all got brushed with the PTSD brush a little bit. It just depended on how you compartmentalized and processed all of the trauma and tragedy you saw. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, some of my colleagues uh, suffered to such a degree that they took their own lives. Mm-hmm. And one of the other bad fallouts is The fact that so many of us are now sick. Uh, I I have a technically incurable leukemia, but I I can last for many, many years in remission. Uh, One of my dear friends uh, just last week was diagnosed with a very, very serious cancer. And unfortunately, this cancer doesn't have the best of an outlook. So 20 years later, we've actually surpassed the amount of people killed on that morning, there was 2,977. And there's now well over 3,000 rescue and recovery workers who've succumbed to mostly cancers and respiratory diseases from the toxins we breathed in. So there's a daily, almost weekly daily reminder of how vulnerable we are because so many folks are still coming down sick. And and it's sort of a, even though there's thousands of us that were there, it's sort of a small family. Everyone sort of knows each other. So it makes, want, it makes me personally appreciate every single day. I want to just reiterate that point you made, which is something I didn't know until I met you. Um, the, the death toll after 9-11 surpassing the day itself. And that is really not something that I don't, I don't think has penetrated our culture, really. Um, and I think speaks to sort of the ripple effects that we were talking about. Um, Niels, one of the things I, I most appreciate about you is that, so Niels is, you know, a, uh, a firehouse of a man. He's a tall guy, pretty bar- barrel chested guy. He basically, when he gives you a hug, he, he crushes a couple of ribs, big, hand- <laughs> big catcher's mitt handshake. Um, and, you know, he is, if you were to draw a firefighter, you would draw someone, I think, like Niels. And uh, in, in, in that sense, you know, he's a very strong, imposing figure. But Niels, you're also so uh, you're not like someone, for instance, you know, who uh, I, you know, you think about folks who went to Vietnam and there's an entire generation of people who didn't want to talk about the things that they experienced. Uh, they were really afraid to be vulnerable about what happened to them and their friends just because it was so painful to talk about. And one of the things that you've dedicated your time, you know, after your service to is really diving into those extremely painful stories and, um, and that grief that you still feel to this day for so many things. Um, and it's really extraordinary to me. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the lessons you've learned about processing uh, grief um, and, and what maybe we could learn from your experience. Well, I appreciate that, Austin. And uh, I guess I'm a fairly large guy, but I could definitely uh, probably shed 50 pounds right now in this retirement world of mine. But thank you. You're very kind. Um, yeah, I've always been a type of per- person where, um, you know, I was bullied badly as a young, young child. And uh, sometimes I think God made me big just to defend myself. as, as It's my shield. And um you know, my kids laugh because my wife is sort of the tough one in the family. You know, my wife, Annie's the drill sergeant and the kids would always say they were more scared of her than me. And, you know, I, I pride myself with wearing my heart on my sleeve. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I was, I was a New York city cop my first two years. I was an army soldier and a firefighter for a long time. So once in a while, as I used to say, you had to kind of go all street, which meant 
if you if you left that soft exterior show, you were definitely going to get hurt. Mm. Um, I never took joy in, in being, you know, tough or harsh, but at times you're dealing with some vicious, vicious people that are looking to kill you. But what I have learned is with showing that vulnerability, it makes other people who are hurting and suffering, it makes them feel like they can let it out that they're with someone that's not going to hurt them. Uh, you know, I have a cousin of mine in Ireland who I adore and, you know, we've been friends since we we're little kids. And she said, you just have a way of making other people feel good about themselves. And when you really think about it, one of the most valuable things to people is they just want to feel like they matter. You know, we're in such an in your face world right now. It's so harsh and there's, there's so many trust issues and there's a lot of jaded people. But I just like to say to them, sometimes even just with body language, I realize a hug just breaks it down. People realize, hey, this guy's for real. And I just want them to know that you're, you're with someone you can trust. I'm sharing your hurt. I'm sharing your pain. I've been there. I, I've been praying for death when I was in the cancer hospital. I, I got two and a half years of chemotherapy in seven days where I was going to die. And sadly enough, I was praying to die. But then when I realized that I had a chance at life, I was begging to live. So I think I'm so thankful for that humbling. I was humbled to the very ground, you know, laying there crying and, and you know, vomiting and, and, you know, nurses caring for me. And I was so embarrassed, but yet they smiled and held my hand and said, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. So I'm sort of on a little mission now in my life. You know, I, 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 I guess I'm a little lost. Uh, I loved what I did. I loved helping people. And after almost 25 years of doing it, I got pretty good at it. And I don't mean that in a hearty way, but you know, when you do something for 25 years, it's you usually get pretty good at it. And it was stripped away when I, when I got cancer because the fire department won't let you stay on. And I was searching for a way to sort of do some good and stop feeling sorry for myself. Uh, I was more sad about losing the fire department job than possibly losing my life, as strange as that might sound. And when I got involved with the 20 for 20 podcast, I realized, wow, this was, this was the bolt of lightning I was looking for. It gave me an opportunity to speak to these incredible people who had stories way more impactful than mine, who suffered way more than I did. And some of them, they're not even here anymore. They died on that day of 9-11, or they died from some horrible illnesses since, uh, specifically firefighter Ray Pfeiffer, who was an advocate with terminal cancer, fighting terminal cancer for eight years, would go down to Washington, D.C. every couple of weeks to beg politicians to do what was right and to pay our medical bills. And we got to interview Ray's wife and to hear his story, his determination. The man was dying and literally till his dying day was on the phone and on email advocating for other people who were suffering. And, and the crazy thing about it is Ray would see you, he'd smile and he'd say, how are you doing? How are you? Are you feeling okay? And all the while, we didn't realize how sick he was because he put up such a brave face, such a beautiful smile. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm searching for a way now. I'm hoping somewhere down the road to get into a permanent project where we tell about stories about the good guys, about the people out there that are trying to make a difference. You know, there's so many unsung heroes out there on a daily basis. And they don't consider themselves heroes. They just consider themselves doing their job. But it's funny. We're in a culture and in a world where if an actor slaps another actor or there's some sort of scandalous affair in Hollywood, it's worldwide news. But we don't hear of these dozens and dozens of stories that happen each day around the country, hundreds of them, where, where people just went out and helped strangers. And sometimes they're not even responders. They're just, just ordinary people who did something extraordinary. 
you know, if I, if I had a, another opportunity, I'd love to open up a hug booth somewhere <laughs> in, you know, Times Square, Manhattan or, or Broadway in Nashville or, or, you know, out in LA, some busy, busy thoroughfare. And, you know, not for commerce, not to get paid, just to stand there and say, hey, somebody gives a crap. Here, bring it in. Here's a big old Nell's bear hug. I just want you to know that you matter. And, and that's really it, Austin. It's just a matter of trying to do some good, you know, and before my sands of time in my life went out, I, I, I want to do some more good. I, I really would love to do a lot of good. Um, I, I was lucky enough to be interviewed by uh, the podcaster Lex Friedman, and he asked me if there was one thing that you could achieve, what would it be? And I said, I'd love to be a billionaire. I said, but not because I need gold plated plumbing fixtures and you know, limousines everywhere and my own jet, but because I want to give it away. I want to put smiles on people's faces every day, find someone who is truly in need and just make a difference in their life. And, and I'm hoping to find that way to do it. You know, I may, I may not ever get the chance, but I, I just really love putting smiles on people's faces. I really encourage folks, I mean, not only just for smiles, but uh, just the perspective that Neil's work on the 20 for 20 podcast. I'm <laughs> fortunate enough that we were involved um, on the iron light side in that. And it was just, it's just one of my favorite projects ever. And Neil's does such a great job um, just connecting with folks. And he has this unique ability to, um, to really have people let their guard down. And you talked about Ray Pfeiffer. Folks may know him. He was deeply involved uh, with Jon Stewart. And John Stewart gave a great gave a great eulogy um, at his funeral that I, I, I encourage folks to check out. Um, Niels does a great job telling Ray's story in his podcast. Niels, what are some other stories that really stick out to you? Um, that when people ask about the work that you were doing, it's like, oh man, I got to tell them about this one. Uh, you know, Austin, I could I could tell you about every single episode, but you know, a couple of them that really jump out. Uh, is uh, Father Mark Hanna, and you know Father Mark was was an operating engineer, a building engineer at the World Trade Center. Uh, you know the morning of nine eleven, and he basically, uh, with with a team of his other coworkers, they went about trying to rescue people that were trapped, uh, and and unfortunately, his two coworkers died, and his boss ordered him to take this elderly man, a Mo and carry him down to safety. And strange enough, Mark got to the 21st floor and was waiting at a, a triage area. And strange enough, we never knew this, but Captain Patrick Brown of Ladder Company 3, who subsequently per perished with his, with his firefighters from Ladder 3, he came across Mark and he said, you need to keep going, sir. Don't stay here. No one's coming up for you. And they... You know, Captain Brown asked where he could get some water and they broke into a soda machine and they gave the crew waters and Gatorades and Father Mark took a couple and they put them in his pocket and he physically assisted Mo all the way down to the, the second floor lobby and had to physically carry him over his shoulder out of the building. And there's video evidence that Father Mark and Mo are actually the two last survivors to come out of that tower and the tower came down right aside them moments after and father mark was so touched by that event that he literally devoted his life now he's an egyptian coptic priest in saint mary's parish in east brunswick new jersey and father mark called me the night before 9 11 and we had already done our interview and he just said i just want you to know that i love you and I said, I love you too, Father. And I was so blown away with this connection where here's this man who opened up and told me, you know, step by step what they had done just to survive and how he felt that he was so powerfully touched by a spirit that he now had to dedicate the rest of his life to that spirit. And that spirit being God and the Egyptian Coptic faith. Um, just incredible to sit with him and talk. And then there's a married couple 
that are in their 70s, um, Sonia and Joe Agron. And Joe was a combat Marine in Vietnam and a decorated New York City police officer. And Sonia worked as an EMT for the city until she was injured and then dedicated her life to volunteering at the Red Cross. And they both spent a considerable amount of time down at, at the World Trade Center, or as a lot of people will call it, Ground Zero. And Sonia was one of those angel ladies, we call them, uh, who would come around with soup and water. And, you know, because the weather changed, you know, we started the operation, it was hot. And then it continued on through Christmas and on until May of 02. So then we had the winter. And they were the people that would give you fresh socks or another t-shirt or whatever it is you needed just for comfort. And Sonia devoted hundreds and hundreds of hours there. And she's still a volunteer at the 9-11 Museum. And the sad, cruel irony is Sonia and Joe are both fighting terminal cancers. And in the course of interviewing them, Joe had never told his story to anyone because it was too, too hurtful. His birthday is 9-11. And at the end of the interview with Sonia, he said, do you mind if I talk? And he switched seats with her. And I said, of course. I, I you know, I, Alex, our producer, I said, is it okay? He said, of course, let's, let's do it. And Joe just started telling us about his experience. And it was, it was heart rendering because Sonia had never heard it. She, she couldn't believe it. And he came up to the, at the end of the interview and he said to me, can, can, I, can I give you a hug? And I said, of course, Joe. I says, I'm a big hugger. And he kissed me on the cheek and he said, I love you, my brother. Please make sure that people hear my story before I leave, before I go, which means before he dies. And Austin, I took that as such a huge responsibility because here was this humble, humble American hero who spent his entire life giving back, never asking what can you do for me, but what can I do for you? And he just wants to make sure that the story of he and his fellow responders and recovery workers and volunteers like his wife, Sonia, that they just don't get forgotten. And one of the sad facts we learned from the, proce from the process of doing the podcast is in almost half the school districts in the United States, there's no curriculum to teach about 9-11. And in multiple, multiple districts, it's actually considered offensive material. Now, I know history that sometimes can be cruel and can be painful, but this is reality. This is what happened. And it needs to be told to our young people, especially because they don't even know what it's about. Um, I, I, I was with my family and was wearing my fire department hat and a young lady, it's about 12 or 13, asked me if I was a fireman. And I said, well, I used to be. And she said, well, why aren't you anymore? You still look young. I said, well, I have cancer from 9-11 and I had to retire. And she said, well, what was 9-11 exactly? Wasn't it a plane crash? Ugh. And she said, we don't, they don't teach us that in school. And she was quite an intelligent young lady. It wasn't as if it's just that she wasn't given the opportunity to know about it. So, so one of my little missions is I want to try to do some more outreach with educating and just letting people know. Not, not pushing it on them, not trying to convince them of anything, but just, just delivering it to them like a straight fastball in baseball. Just say, this is what happened. These are the people that were there. And I just want you to know that so many beautiful, beautiful American people gave their lives for strangers and are still unfortunately losing their lives because of what they did for strangers on those days and months of 9-11 and the days that followed. Niels, you talk about these extraordinary, you know, volunteers like Sonia, right? Um, just took it upon herself to go down and give people what they needed, um, who were doing so much for her and for her community. Um, I, I think I'd like to close with one first, just people should go to 20for20podcast.com, 2-0-4-F-O-R-2-O for F -O -R -2 -O podcast. Dot com um, and listen to Neil's work. It's truly incredible. Um, but what what's one thing people could do to express their thanks and to make sure, you know, the memories of those folks who we've lost don't fade away? 
Well, one thing I like to do, Austin, is when I see some of these proud older veterans that are wearing Vietnam veteran hat, um, unfortunately, you don't see so many World War II veteran hats anymore because those brave souls are all in their 90s now, and there's not many of them left. And I've realized when I go up and say, thank you for your service, I really appreciate what you did, and I'm free because of it. The smile that it puts on their face is incredible. It's almost as if I handed them $1,000, right? I mean, I wish I could just hand them $1,000, each one that I see. I think what's happened in society is we've become, I don't know if it's apparent to so many people, but we've become very ungrateful. Um, you know, I, used, I like to use this line and, you know, Alex always tells me, stay positive. But, you know, a couple of times I've seen people on, on the line at the, the latte stand unravel because the barista ran out of oat milk. I mean, literally have a meltdown. And I'm like, okay, we'll just use, you know, half and half or, or something else. Or, you know, and, and, but they literally, their day was ruined because they couldn't get the milk they wanted. You know, maybe almond milk. I don't know. I, I'm a half and half guy. That's why I'm overweight, right? But, but my whole thing is, I just want to see us come back to, we called it the 912 syndrome. Austin, I wish you could have seen it personally. On 912 of 2001, the West Side Highway adjacent to the World Trade Center was lined with thousands and thousands of Americans from all sorts of backgrounds and races and religions and just, just, just a, a cross section of what America is. But the common denominator of all of them was they were all holding up signs supporting us and supporting America. They were holding flags. They were hugging, they were crying, they were loving each other, and they didn't even know each other, right? As sad of a day that was, it was one of the most beautiful days I've seen in my life because we had unity. We all rallied around something that meant something to us, and that was our country. And I wouldn't lie to you and say that there hasn't been some horrible things that have happened in our country's history, but Show me a country where it hasn't. But all I know is I'm a first generation American. My mom is off the boat from Ireland and she still has the accent and she still calls me twice a day because <laughs> in her mind, I'm three years old. But when my grandfather Nils was from Denmark and he was one of those success stories who arrived here with like 30 bucks in his pocket and had a sponsor family and went on to be a success. And my mom and my grandma and my father, who's a retired New York City firefighter, who was my idol growing up. You know, to me, I lived with Superman, Batman, and Spider Man all wrapped into one because my dad was a New York City fireman. But I just would love to see that 912 syndrome come back, where even if it was just a day when everybody put down their war hatchet and said, Time out, guys, let's all hug it out. And, and I really think we could make some progress. You know, the problem right now in America, I think Austin is, we're looking at facades and we're judging, but we're not looking at people's souls. We're not looking at what they're really about. And I think most people, just about everyone has some goodness in them. We just have to draw it out. But when, when we have people that constantly zero in on the negative and the bad and the horrible, and nothing against the press, but they seem to broker in that. They, they want turmoil. They want division. They want frustration. But there's so many good stories out there that they can tell, but they just don't. So I've been one of those lucky guys, thanks to you and Iron Light and Alex and Joey and Ryan and Joe and everybody who's on the team who's helped us along, who made me sound like a somewhat, you know, listenable. <laughs> I take it as such an honor to be the voice for these great, great people. I, I, I mean, I am so touched and blessed that I had an opportunity to do this project. And I truly, in my heart, hope I can keep going with it because I've actually had dozens of people who contacted me. Some I knew, some I didn't even know, said, hey, I'd like to tell my story. Could you tell my story? And I'm like, yeah, I really want to tell your story. So I'm hoping that that can happen. 
But Austin, I really appreciate your time and, and the opportunity to, to talk to you about it. And, and please thank everyone at Iron Light because this has been one of the highlights of my life. And I've been blessed to do a lot of cool things. And I also want to put a shout out to the actor Bobby Burke. Bobby's a dear friend of mine. Uh, I had the privilege of working with him on the TV show Rescue Me, uh, the Dennis Leary production. And I was the lucky guy who drove the fire truck for them. It's a, it's a show about a haunted 9-11 firefighter. And Bobby and I have become friends and dear friends. And Bobby was best friends with Father Michael Judge, our chaplain who was killed that morning, praying as, as our guys were running in. And he was also best friends with Captain Patty Brown. And Bobby devoted an episode to this, this series about Captain Brown to tell his story. And Bobby was also the voice on the outro for every episode. And Bobby was so touched by the events of 9-11 that he's dedicated his life now to being a volunteer firefighter in Long Island, New York. Mm. And he's your atypical Hollywood guy. Here, here's a guy that will come home from a movie set and at 2.30 in the morning, he'll get up out of bed because some elderly lady's having a stroke or four in the morning because someone's car garage is burning down. So Bobby's that kind of guy. He's just a wonderful human being, and he was a big part of 20 for 20. So just want to thank him for all of his time. Absolutely. So uh, I think a great image to, to, to end on in people's minds is that, that image on the West Side Highway. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, Niels, you have such a beautiful soul, and it is so evident in the service that you've given both in uniform and out of uniform. So I am so happy to know you. I'm so proud to know you. And just sincerely, thank you for everything that you do. Well, so right back at you, sir. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor. And I truly, truly thank you for the opportunity. And, um, you know, just just let us do good. I think that's that's what we we owe these people. Let us just do some good in their memory. But thank you very much. Copy that. Thank you for listening. Uh, and Niels, thank you for talking. Thank you, sir.